King Charles III will be the first British king in history to have his coronation televised. His mother, Queen Elizabeth, made history with her own televised coronation in 1953. It's a ceremony full of pomp and circumstance, cloaked in mystery and steeped in tradition, with a healthy dose of historical pettiness and happenstance. Take the location. The crowning of British monarchs in Westminster Abbey is a tradition that dates back to 1066 and the time of William the Conqueror. Having just wrested control of England from the Saxons at the Battle of Hastings, William chose to be crowned in the same location as Harold, the Saxon king, as a symbolic gesture. Then there's the chair. Known as the coronation chair, it was commissioned by King Edward I in 1296 and has been the seat upon which all British monarchs have been crowned since. Originally covered in gilding and glass, the coronation chair is one of the oldest pieces of furniture in the United Kingdom. But why did Edward have it built? Take a look at what lies underneath the coronation chair, the Stone of Scone, or Scoon, aka the Stone of Destiny. This simple block of sandstone was the seat that Scottish kings were crowned upon since at least early medieval times. Of course, all that changed in 1296, when Edward I conquered Scotland and had the stone moved to Westminster Abbey. The chair is designed to sit on top of the stone, symbolizing the dominance of the British monarchy over Scotland. The stone was returned by the British government to Scotland in 1996 and is kept with the Scottish crown jewels in Edinburgh Castle to this day, unless there's a coronation. This is actually the first time that's come up. On coronation day, King Charles and his wife Camilla will travel to the Abbey in the Diamond Jubilee coach. It's the first time that this carriage has been used at a coronation. It was delivered to Queen Elizabeth II in 2014 and used for the state opening of Parliament that year and on a few occasions subsequently. But of course, therefore, it's never had the chance to be used in such a historic and important occasion. Then comes the ceremony itself, led by the Archbishop of Canterbury and featuring the newly made Cross of Wales which includes fragments of wood which some believe to be from the true cross upon which Jesus Christ was crucified. Next comes the only constitutionally mandated part of the ceremony, during which the king will make his vow to uphold the law and defend the faith. Then comes the anointing. The oil, which is the holy oil, the chrism, which has been consecrated, is poured into a spoon, very old item of regalia. And the Archbishop of Canterbury with the, takes the oil and anoints the monarch in three different places. The oil, consecrated in Jerusalem, was produced from olives that grew from groves on the Mount of Olives at the Monastery of the Ascension and the Church of Mary Magdalene, the burial place of Charles's grandmother, Princess Alice of Battenberg. After the anointing, it's on to the investiture, where the king will be presented with the famous crown jewels. So this is when the king is dressed up to look like a king. One of the relics is the sovereign's orb, Commissioned for Charles II's coronation in 1661, it's made of gold and has well over 300 diamonds on it. Then there's the sovereign scepter with cross, the world's largest colorless cut diamond, intended to symbolize the monarch's religious power. There's a few swords, including the sword of state, which represents the monarch's authority in the country. And we can't forget the famous wedding ring of England, composed of a sapphire with a ruby cross set in diamonds, commissioned back in 1831. This all symbolizes that he or she is taking on the role of monarch. He actually is saying, yes, I will be monarch. This is the contract. It's like the most gold covered job contract signing you could imagine. Of course, it wouldn't be a coronation ceremony without a crown. St. Edward's crown, in this case, made of solid gold, weighing nearly five pounds and decorated with 444 precious and semi-precious stones. It was destroyed when Charles I was beheaded and then recommissioned in 1661 for Charles II. So Edward's crown is the centerpiece of the regalia and it is the final moment, is the culmination of the investiture. Just like the crown, a lot of the original items used in the coronation ceremony have been destroyed, altered or lost to time over the often tumultuous centuries of British history. Camilla will also get her own mini ceremony as queen consort. She will have a mini version of the ceremony that he has. So he is anointed and crowned first. She will follow in a kind of watered down version. The sovereign is then presented to the congregation, the rest of the abbey and the world as the monarch. For their post coronation tour, the king and queen consort will travel in the gold state coach. Commissioned in 1760, this massive coach weighs over four tons and requires a team of eight horses to pull. 
They'll end the coronation procession with a classic royal greeting and wave from the balcony at Buckingham Palace. Coronation looks back to our tradition and draws enormously from it. It looks round at our society and seeks to reflect us as we are with joy and celebration. While the guest list for King Charles' coronation will be much smaller than his mother's was in 1953, thanks to the wonders of modern technology, centuries-old traditions and regalia will be on full display in high definition. In a nod to his mother's 1953 coronation chicken, a somewhat controversial choice, Charles chose quiche filled with spinach, broad beans, and tarragon for community lunches planned across Britain to celebrate the grand event. <laughs>